Welcome back, Journeys with the Messiah. We're talking with both the photographer and the author and the, the visionary behind all of this, Michael Belk. And Michael, we want to get to some of the images and I want to get to the backstory of a lot of these and how God showed up in so many of these shots and how he showed up in your life personally. But let's take a look at this one. It's called A Step Away. And this is an extremely interesting photograph. All of these images, Bob, began with a message. And so A Step Away, I wanted to show the divide that has occurred between man and God and that uh, that no one is without sin, that everyone has been divided from God by their sin because God is holy and we're not. So in this image was to show these two groups of people, uh, one that you thought were the good guys and one that you thought were the bad guys to show that that's not necessarily the case that we're, we're all divided from God by, by, you know, by the nature of sin. And we, we look at these images and we look at your career as a fashion photographer and think, well, that's an easy transition to, to go into something like this. And this wasn't some corporately funded project. Tell me how God showed up in all this and how you, how you worked your way through this personal commitment. As I was about to turn 60, I sat down with my wife, Cheryl, and I said, what if I die next year and I haven't done this? What happens when I go to heaven and face God, and he says, how come you didn't do this project I gave you? And he says, you know, I've given you the talent, I've given you the resources, you know, I've given you everything, I've trained you up in this for 30 years, <laughs> well, why didn't you do it? And I said, I, you know, I'd really like to go in more to an applause than that. So we decided we'd put my fashion career on hold for just a year, and, uh, and we would invest, you know, up to $100,000, you know, to do this. When I was in Italy in August, prepping for the shoot, and the new producer, who was phenomenal, Maurizio Antonini, uh, you know, after we met a couple of days later, he says, you can't do this for the amount of money you've set aside. And I said, what, what are we talking about? And he said, triple that. Wow. So, you know, now we're committed to spend $300,000 just to do the shoot part, okay? Just, just to create the images. And... Uh, we go to, to, to Italy then in October and the stock market crashes. The last thing that happened was about, I guess about five years ago, uh, maybe six years ago, the last thing we sold was our personal home at a, at a massive loss. And, uh, and we lost it all. You know, um, that was a painful, incredibly painful experience, but God's given us many years to understand the necessity of stripping us of our own self-sufficiency. Because we were telling everybody, this was our money. Our money we invested in this. We put our money in this. And one day God showed me, no, it was my money. <laughs> and you almost squandered it too. <laughs> one of my favorite images, and I want to get to that one, is the Last Supper scene. But tell yeah. me the story behind this, because it's a dynamic story of how God not only showed up in the shoot, but made an impact in, in part of the cast life. I knew the story of Jesus telling his disciples, you know, this is, this is my body and this is my blood, but I just didn't understand the story, really, that this related to the Old Testament, the Passover lamb. God tells the Israelites if they put the blood of a Passover lamb or the blood of, of, a, uh, of a lamb, over the doorpost of their home, and this had to be an unblemished lamb, which was considered to be such a great sacrifice, that if you put the blood of the unblemished lamb, the angel of death would recognize that home as one of God's people, and he would pass over and spare that child. And I said, oh, geez, people need to know this story. How are we going to tell that? So we decided to switch out Jesus with a live lamb <laughs> at the table. That's brave. That requires, a miracle. that requires a miracle, Bob. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me about the miracle, because I saw this in video, and my wife and I just love it. Yeah. Yeah, so, so you know, so we had the whole idea, you know, and, and uh, so the trainer brought the, uh, brought the lamb in, and that was the first time it dawned on me, how are we going to get a lamb to sit still at a table? So the Christian part of the crew, we got together and we prayed. And we just said, God, we hate to put you on the spot, but we actually need a, 
miracle <laughs> right now. We need this lamb to sit still while we do this photograph because we were doing one second exposures because of the way we were lighting it. And uh, when they put the they, when they put the lamb in there, they put his feet, feet. They put an apple crate in there and blankets, and they set him up. And he put his hooves, put it right on the table. And in in retrospect, I think God put him in a trance because the lamb just sat there and stared at me for twenty frames in a row without moving. And I love to tell the story that the disciples moved more than the uh, lamb did. And it was just, it was just an amazing moment because this was impossible. And yet in prayer, we ask God, would you mind doing a miracle for us? And then we saw it. And when you see a miracle occur, it's going to change you. When the trainer was walking out, my camera guy and producer stopped him and said, give Michael the lamp. And so they handed me the lamb. And if you have never held a lamb, it's better than a puppy. Uh, I mean, they're amazing. But uh, they said, look at the camera and tell us what happened here tonight. And I got about three words out and just fell apart. Another great image that, that I really loved was RSVP. And uh, tell me the backstory to that, because it's a very interesting photograph. Uh, so, you know, you get these invitations and they say RSVP. And, uh, and I won't even try and pronounce the French phrase of that, but, uh, but it means, you know, you know, I can't, you know, I, I regret that I can't come. And so in the, in the story, the, the banquet man has, um, invited many guests. And when it comes time for the party, they start offering really lame excuses as to why they can't attend the party. And as you know, in the scripture, you know, the guy sends his people into the street, he gets mad, he says, the street and says, I want you to invite everybody, the blind, the lame, and the poor. And then he says something that to me is one of the most powerful statements in the gospel. He said, none of those who were invited will ever taste of my great feast. And when I understood that story, that, that, that Jesus is throwing the greatest party that will ever be given a life and eternity with him, and that the invitation's been extended to all of us, but there will come a time in which the gates to the party will be closed, and it will be too late to enter if you haven't accepted that invitation. So we've got to show this, you know. So, you know, what we did is uh, uh, we, we hired a company, to our producer hired a company, a catering company, to come in and set up the banquet with a beautiful table with the candelabra and the china, and then we had the first century people sitting with Jesus having a great time. And then in the background, we, we set up a balustrade across there as, the, as that divider between, between those who have accepted the invitation to heaven and those who haven't. And we've got all of those people first century and they're dressed in tuxedos and evening gowns and stuff. We're talking hours to, to set this up and light it. And we started it. We started at maybe two o'clock in the afternoon to shoot this at night, you know, and it's got tons of movie lights and so forth. And um, it just, it just, you know, I would love to take credit for the photographs, Bob. I can't. These are so far above my pay grade. This was God from the beginning. Only God could create something like this. Uh, and I just look at that picture. I have that picture here in my home, and I just look at it in total amazement of what he created that night. And when you look at these photographs, you've got a lot of personal investment. I mean, just what God was telling you throughout this whole story. And one of those is, is uh, uh, daily bread because it, it impacted you personally because it just taught you a lesson again about God's, uh, God's supply. Yeah. Yeah, when uh, when I was you know working on on this, so originally I had a few ideas, and then when we decided we're going to do it, I really had to spend a lot of lot of time listening. And I was reading in John where the disciples had asked Jesus to pray, and he was showing them the form of prayer, which has become a corporate prayer for us today. But the form of prayer and the different parts of it, but the one give us day by day the amount of bread we need. So 
you know, I, I realized that um, I wanted my bread now, <laughs> you know. And, yeah, I was sitting there and said, I, I want my bread now. Uh, I want lots of bread. I want retirement bread. I want enough bread to do this photo shoot the way I, I did it. And then when the stock market, uh, you know, crashed as we were going to Italy, um, I realized I was going to have to depend on God's provision and that I had to allow him to supply that bread. So uh, I didn't even have that shot planned when I left to go to the shoot. And I got there and I told the crew, I said, I'm adding a, I'm adding a shot. I don't know where we're going to do it, what it's going to look like or anything else. Uh, a guy named Kim Dawson, who was part of the American crew, a great, great producer, uh, did the Ninja Turtle stuff and all that. And, uh, Kim came and he said, hey, you got you to gotta come see what I, what I found. And, and we went in, it was this 12th century courtyard of a cathedral. And we, we put it together and then I couldn't figure out really what to do with the loaves of bread. And at one point I just turned to the, turned to our modern day guy and I said, Hey, I want you to do this. I just want you to pick up all this, all the loaves of bread, all seven loaves of bread and walk away. And then I went over to Sergio, who was our Jesus actor. And I said, so if you're Jesus and you're sitting there and a guy walks off with all the loaves of bread, what are you going to do? And he said, well, I'd probably laugh at him. And I said, well, great, let's laugh at him. And we put the shot together and started shooting Jesus laughing at this guy walking. So, so it's, it's just so typical of us. You know, we want to hoard the bread and Jesus is laughing at us. And, and, and that, in that photo, Jesus is laughing at the man walking away. And, and some people get offended by, by humanizing Jesus that much. Uh, do you get any cr critical uh, re uh, you know, feedback on, on shots like that? The, I received a coffee table book uh, back, you know, Journey's coffee table book, you know, back in the mail. And uh, there was no note in it. Uh, other than the person's address, um, didn't seem to be anything wrong with it. So I looked up her order and I said, could you tell me what the problem is? And she very bluntly said, yeah, that, that one daily bread, I just didn't like, like seeing Jesus laughing. And I said, yeah, okay, you know. Uh, and so that is quite a statement because Maybe in many ways the church hasn't presented the human side of Jesus. You know, Jesus laughed. He was 100% human as well as 100% God. You know, he laughed. Uh, they probably sat around and told jokes, probably not the ones I've told in my life. But, um, you know, it's the human part of Jesus. He, he was here with us. To close this out, Michael, I want to give you a choice because there's people out there that this, this really rings with them about just giving what, they, what God's given them, give it back to him and, and let him work with it. There's two images, and, and one is vacancy, and the other one is all in. And I'm going to let you close with, with one of the stories about one of those shots, because they're both, uh, they both impact people in their commitment to Christ. Well, thanks. The winning hand, the one you're talking about, all in. The winning hand was created. Uh, that's the group of guys, you know, sitting around the, sitting around the table in tuxedos. But you might notice that one guy sitting at the table is in first century, okay? And the idea, and I'm going to come back to that in a second, but the idea was to say we don't get to choose the hands that were dealt in life. We get to choose how to play them. And if we're not turning to Jesus in helping us play our hands, that's when we start gambling with our lives. And we might as well fold, okay? But recently... I was watching uh, a James Bond kind of show, and the guys are in the in the casino, sitting around in their tuxedos. And one guy takes his whole stack and he shoves it forward with the classic "I'm all in," meaning I'm betting everything I got on that. And I paused that television program and stared at it and said out loud, "God, am I all in? I don't believe I am." I believe I want to be all in, but I really am not. I haven't gone all in, and I need I need to go go all in. So I started just you know looking at that whole idea and saying, do we believe that Jesus Christ is the winning hand? 
And are we willing to go all in knowing that with him we cannot lose? It's impossible to lose. And, and, and so, uh, so now when I do a presentation, I close with that image because it's, it's just such a powerful message. Are you all in? Are you willing to go in with the one who never loses? And, uh, and that's what that one's about. Beautiful image. Uh, Michael, that's a beautiful story as well. It's a great invitation to close this segment out. I really appreciate that. If people want to find out more about the book, where can, where can they go right now? Uh, they can go to our website, journeyswiththemessiah.org. Uh, we've got you know the books and the DVDs, posters, fine art pieces, and uh, the new film series soon to come. I want to thank Michael again for being with us today on Viewpoint. And if you want more information on how to obtain a copy of Journeys with the Messiah, either the smaller book, the abridged book, or the coffee table book, uh, you can uh, go to journeyswiththemessiah.org. Michael also speaks in churches, makes video presentations. There's uh, DVDs available. If you want any of that information, go to the website, journeyswiththemessiah.org. If you'd like more information about Jesus Christ or how to connect to a local church, go to our website or Facebook page. We have a lot more resources there that we can connect you with. Plus, I'd like to hear from you. Here's what's on the next Viewpoint.